chapter 6. John 6. <clears throat> John 6. Our context today has about 71 verses. And it's probably not quite possible uh, for me to preach all 71 verses in a frame of time that would have you out in time for when you think you should have lunch today. And knowing that different people have medical conditions which require them to eat at certain times, I'll try to be uh, <laughs> sensitive to that. So let's just read a few of the verses today that kind of get us to the heart of the matter in our context, and then we'll spend a good bit of time explaining and uh, a little bit of time applying as well the Word of God this morning. Would you please look in chapter 6 all the way down to verse 26? Actually, 25. We'll read verses 25 through 30. Uh, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. That may be worthwhile for you to highlight in your Bible. Verse 30, They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we look at believers and unbelievers, help us to ascertain the simplicity of the choice of belief, as well, God, as to have revealed and laid bare for us the rebellion of unbelief, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't have a lot of time to review to get into our context today, because like I said before, there's a lot of material here for us to make it through. But we are following up two miracles that Jesus did that are mentioned in John's Gospel here. And by saying mentioned, I mean that's it. They're really only mentioned in John's Gospel. The one miracle was the feeding of the 5,000. And the other miracle was Jesus walking on water. And it's interesting the difference in perspective that really illustrates the thematic difference between the Gospel of John and the other Gospels. If you want another illustration of it, it's right here in chapter 6. Because if you were to read in Matthew 14 about Jesus walking on the water, you'd see the whole scenario of Peter and uh, Jesus' uh, Jesus's, uh, illustration and example to Peter about faith. And, and uh, you'd see those things. But it's interesting that John just says, yeah, Jesus walked across on the water. Didn't mention Peter. Didn't mention you know all the... The, the things that were happening as Jesus is crossing over. Why? Well, because John's not trying to tell us who Jesus is. John's trying to tell us how to believe in Jesus. And that's the difference between the other three Gospels and the Gospel of John. Jesus is the Gospel. But there's a difference between knowing who Jesus is and believing in Jesus, and that's why John wrote his Gospel. Many other miracles did Jesus, which are not written in this book. Uh, but these are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. So John's Gospel is written to help us to believe. And so it's worth your noting, if you want to study Matthew 14 and look at the difference between Matthew's account and John's account, it helps us to understand again what John, the Gospel of John's about. Pastor, you're so repetitive. I wish I were more repetitive. I wish I were more clearly repetitive, to be honest with you, because I want us to know what the Gospel of John is, because here's the deal. Christians get confused when they preach the Gospel. Because the Gospel is Jesus. But when we try to get people to receive the Gospel so that they can believe and be baptized and be taught, we don't know how to tell them what to believe or how to receive in Jesus. And the illustration of it is to grab the average Gospel tract and read the, quote, sinner's prayer at the end of the Gospel tract. You can't hardly find one that will agree with another. Because, you know, one says, well, you need to repent of your sins and ask God to forgive you. That isn't the gospel. You need to repent of your sins and ask God to forgive you. Well, friend, there are all kinds of people that repent of their sins. The only reason God forgives sins is because Jesus paid for them. He was crucified for your sin. 
So your sin is transferred to Jesus Christ. So you don't need to repent of your sins. You need to receive Jesus. Receive the free gift of eternal life. And that's the difference. You have to believe. And John is just laying bare the misconceptions and the religions that are all about knowledge and and acts and works and behaviors. And John just over and over again tells us you have to believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. That's the gospel. And this is another passage of Scripture which illustrates that. There's a lot of questions that many believers have regarding, you know, why do some people believe and others don't believe? Why, why in the same home do two children, sometimes even twins, grow up one believing and another not believing? Obviously, the environment and the exposure and uh, the things that they learn and hear are similar or even the same. What makes the difference between someone who believes and someone doesn't? And John, is in this passage, or in this portion of the Gospel, is interjecting some teaching of Jesus that explains that. Jesus is very, very terse. He's very frank with the people that asked Him, How did you get here? See, right before this, he fed the 5,000. And then how he got there was he walked on water. He told his disciples, cross over. And then he came later, and he walked on water. That's how he got there. Okay, the, the, the irony of it, I hope, doesn't escape you. Master, Wince came, came and said, how'd you, how'd you come to be here? Well, you know, I walked across the water to get here. After I fed you with a few loaves and a couple fish. 5,000 of you. Okay, that's... That brings us into our context. Okay, might Jesus, the person, Jesus, uh, even humanly speaking, the humanity of Christ here, might He be an impressive individual? The signs, the miracles that Jesus did, we know, were so that we could know that Jesus is the Christ. And so that we could believe, right? Jesus has done the miracles. If you were at the gathering where five loaves and two small fish fed 5,000 people. What more do you need? What more do you need? Well, Jesus exposes not what they need, but what their perceived need is. You see this? When they asked Him the question, He didn't say, I walked on water. Look at verse 25, the, the, the last phrase. Rabbi, when camest thou hither? How'd you get here? When'd you come here? Verse 26, Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles. Do you see it? You see what Jesus is saying when He said, you're not looking for me because you saw miracles. <laughs> now they say they want miracles. They say they want evidence. They want proof that Jesus is God. But they've seen the miracles. Jesus said, you're not looking for me because you seek miracles. You're looking for me because you ate the bread and were filled. In other words, you like food. Physical food. You want physical food. That's why you came. Uh, I can relate. <laughs> Can't you? Uh, isn't it incredible sometimes what we're willing to settle for? In other words, the question they ask is positively loaded. Or the answer to the question is loaded, isn't it? I walked on water. That's how and when. When I came here is when I left you after feeding uh, the 5,000. That's a miracle. And then I walked on water. And they aren't interested one bit in the miracles that Jesus did, actually. You see that? They just said, you know, how'd you get away? You know. And Jesus said, you seek me, not because of the miracles. But He said, you, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. He said, all you care about is your stomach. All you care about is your belly. And the fact of the matter is that one of the reasons that people overlook their need for the Savior is because they're more interested in lunch. It's just true, isn't it? They're more interested in how am I going to get this or how am I going to have this. They're more interested in the needs or even desires of the flesh. And Jesus just lays bare the motives behind the question. The question sounds... Well, we're interested in you, Jesus. No, actually, we're interested in you got some more bread. Can I get a little more to eat? And so then he goes on to say, you've got the wrong attitude. You're working for the wrong thing. Labor not for the meat 
which perisheth. The bread that they ate didn't keep them from being hungry again. The, the bread that they ate it wasn't everlasting bread. It wasn't everlasting. And so he said, But for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the God the Father sealed. So we saw that Jesus is living water, right? Or he is the everlasting water when we saw the woman at the well. And Jesus asked the woman to draw for him. And she asked him, Why are you asking me a Samaritan? He said, If you knew who it was that asked you, you'd ask him and he'd give you water that would make it so you'd never thirst again. And boy, that resonated with that lady, didn't it? She says, Give it to me. I don't want to ever have to draw again. I don't want to ever have to. And the reality of it is that the water that she gave made it so that her need never was again physical water. Isn't it tragic that people are dying of sin, but they think that their need is hunger? We're so convoluted in our understanding of not only the work of, and purpose of the church, but of what charity is and what the world's need is, that we think it's a greater and more noble cause to feed hungry people than to feed lost people. And there is a difference. I'm not for starving anyone anywhere. It's not what I'm saying here today. But what I'm saying is that you can feed a starving person, they'll die and go to hell. Because that isn't their real need. But if they have the living water and they have the living bread, my friend, what if they die? Everyone does, don't they? What if you die when you know Jesus, the living water and the living bread? And he's trying to help them understand, don't work for the thing that perishes. Work for the thing which doesn't perish. Eternal life. And they come back at him with the question of, okay, well, how do we do that? But it's not a very sincere question. In verse 28, they said unto, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And now, friend, here's a little caveat for us. Here's a little nugget. Read verse 29. Then answered, or Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. This is almost, not the same, but almost a Mary Martha teaching moment here, isn't it? Remember Martha and being busy and troubled about serving Jesus, working for Jesus, and Mary saying, I just want to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and fellowship with Jesus and learn from Jesus. I just want to hear from Jesus. And Jesus told Martha, Mary's desired the best part. Here are people that are saying, okay, what work do we, what's the eternal work? What does God want us to do? There are so many individuals that would be satisfied to do something for God rather than believe in Jesus. Every Thanksgiving, I get phone calls. People say, is your church feeding the homeless? Every Thanksgiving, is your church feeding the homeless? I'd like to volunteer to feed the homeless. Oftentimes I have people call and say, hey, can I donate meals to feed the hungry? Well, that's great. I'm fine with that. It's a noble purpose and desire. But you know, you, when you usually question, you ask the people, they wouldn't darken the doors of a church. They wouldn't bow before Jesus. But they want to do something good for God. They want to do a work. And it's the very same thing that these individuals are saying to Jesus. They're saying, what can we do? It's sort of like the rich young ruler. Remember when he came to Jesus and said, good master, what good thing must I do? to inherit eternal life. God, can I do something for you? And the answer to that is not a thing in the world. What's God need? I mean, I mean, if I could just give Him some of my wealth, that would be so good for God, wouldn't it? God need wealth? You know, if I could just give Him some respect, does God need respect? What does God need? Friend, nothing. God doesn't need anything that a man could give him. I love it when, uh, when God's Word says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. If I were, what is it? It's one thing, if I, I would not ask you, and if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. What is it? I would not tell thee. I would not tell thee. It's like, why? Because you couldn't do anything for me. God's self-sustaining, my friend. Eternity's not threatened by anything that man does. God doesn't need us. We need God. 
And here are individuals that come because they're hungry for bread. And they don't even think they, they think they can do something for Jesus. Do you see how little they think of him and how much they think of themselves? He's nothing more than, in their minds, just a genie in the bottle. Make food when you need it, and it's convenient for them. But he's not anything to them on a personal level. And so Jesus gets to the heart of the matter, and they ask questions that they think are noble. Well, what, what do we work for? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. Jesus said, what God wants you to do is to believe on Me. Do you see the theme of John coming out here some more? Believe in Jesus. Friend, I'll be honest with you, God didn't save you because of your extraordinary talent. God saved you because you needed to be born again. You needed eternal life. You needed forgiveness for your sins. You needed the work of the cross. God saved you because you needed it. And you needed to believe in Jesus, and believing pleases God. It is an incredible truth that the only thing that, that pleases God is faith. This is what Hebrews says, isn't it? Hebrews 11.6, Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So many people are laboring, trying to do works to please God. They're trying to do works to impress God. And Jesus said, you want to impress God? Believe in me. And so it's incredible that the response wasn't simply, okay, that's not hard to do. Is, is it difficult to believe in one who can turn a few loaves and small fishes into enough food to feed 5,000? Is it difficult to believe in one who can walk on water? The answer is that believing is not difficult, but there was a heart's attitude that made it for some impossible. And by impossible, I do not mean impossible because of God. I mean impossible because of the heart's attitude. And that's what Jesus here exposes. Let's jump ahead just a little bit. And uh, verse, what well, was verse 30? They said, What sign? They said, Therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? In other words, <laughs> you ever see, this is sort of like what I would do with my little brother. You know, are you good at sneaking stuff? You think you could sneak something and mom and dad wouldn't catch you? I always tell, I'd always get my brother to do the dangerous work because, you know, and by saying, you know, you're really good at this. Why don't you do it? Just prove how good you are. You know, and, and he'd be tiptoeing by mom while she's reading her Bible, stealing a jar of pickles or sneaking the cat into the house or whatever, you know, whatever little scheme we'd concoct in his kids. And he thinks, oh man, Ryan thinks I'm really good at this. No, I'm just thinking if he gets caught, he's the one that gets paddled. <laughs> and I'm, I'm free and clear, right? And I can participate in the spoils, but I don't have to participate in the danger. And here they're like, well, let's get Jesus to do a miracle. We'll make some more bread for us. See it? It's a, uh, why don't you do a miracle for us and then, then we'll be able to believe. Jesus had already done miracles for them. And they hadn't believed. And that's what he said. Uh, in verse, uh, verse 35, Jesus talked about bread. Contrast with Moses. In verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see this? Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the water of life. When we're talking about life, we're not talking about the kind of life that you can die. We're talking about the kind of life that you can never die. Eternal life. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of eternal life. I'm the water of eternal life. And he that cometh to me, he that believeth on me, shall never thirst. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. So here's what they said. Well, you do this and we'll believe. Well, you know what they wanted? They wanted him to do something and then they would reap the benefits of it. And then they'd string him along. Well, do it again. Show me one more time. You know, you ever see the sneaker guys at the mall? The guys that wash sneakers? Really annoying, isn't it? Some guy comes up and starts squirting your sneakers. Try mine sometime. My, you know, the things I do in shoes are not normal for those poor sneaker maintenance guys. Most guys, you know, get a little smudge of dirt. Mine's grease on my shoes. You know, it's in my garage. I just grease, it's oil, it's who knows what. You know, blood, whatever. All over my sneakers. And they come start 
boy, you're going to be amazed when you see what I can do with this sneaker. And they, they clean a little spot on your sneaker and leave the rest all dirty. <laughs> try, try, try right there on the toe. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Hey, it's kind of all smudged. See if you can get the whole front of the shoe. I'll try the side. The heel. My shoes don't match. See if you can make this one match. <laughs> we did a good job. Thank you very much. Right? I'm not going to buy this silly stuff, whatever it is. It's just some kind of soap or Windex or who knows. Anybody can wash shoes with something. You wash my shoes, they'll certainly look better than they do uh, when I don't clean them, right? <sighs> Try another spot. Try it again. And they're trying to play the sneaker salesman game with Jesus. Oh, you made bread. Well, why don't you build me a house? How about healing, you know, my sickness? How about... And they're all interested in the miracle, and they're not interested in the person at all. They couldn't care less that Jesus can do anything. They're interested in the anything Jesus can do. The incredible things about the miracles that Jesus did are not the miracles. It's the person. So God's never been impressed by a miracle. There's nothing that's impossible for God. God can do anything, so anything God does is commonplace to Him. It's not impressive. You know, and the closer you get to God, the more you'll realize that. The more you'll be less uh, scintillated by something in some great thing that's really a, a true answer to prayer and you'll see that great answer to prayer is a representation of what is commonplace with a great God and it's a great God that's incredible not the thing that you need right now but you won't even remember 20 years from now I'm going to tell you something I pray for things I lose all the time what did I lose last week I wish I could remember I lost my mind I think my wallet I lost my wallet uh, two Saturdays ago. That's a mess for me. It's a real mess for me. Everything's in it. I don't ever lose my wallet in the time. My, my whole life I've never last, lost in a permanent way my wallet or my keys. And uh, that's one of those recurring nightmares for me if that were to happen. But uh, two Saturdays ago we were supposed to come to the fellowship on Saturday night. When I went to leave I couldn't find where I put my billfold. And what happened was I lost my mind, and that's why I lost my wallet, and that's really the truth. Uh, but I, the last time I'd seen it that I could recollect was at Winn-Dixie the night before. And so I called Winn-Dixie to see if they'd seen my wallet, and they said, well, come by and we'll look at the cameras. Went by Winn-Dixie, and they said, well, you put your wallet in your jeans. Well, I thought I wasn't wearing jeans, but evidently I was. So I found the jeans, I found my wallet. It was no problem. But, you know, I prayed that God would help me to find my wallet because it would be a real mess if I didn't. And, and, and God, just really quickly, I said, God, I don't have all night to be chasing my wall around. I've got to church tomorrow, and, but I need to find it for peace of mind to be able to drive the bus and things like that. And, and God just gave me, well, that happens to me all week long every week, right? I pray for little things, and God answers prayer and gives wisdom all the time. Just God just does that. But the reason that's not a big deal that God helped me find my wallet is because He does it all the time. And it's not because that's commonplace, but what's amazing is the kind of God that He is. See, the reality of it is that had I not found my wallet, I could take my passport and I could go down to the driver's license place and I could take three bills and I could get my birth certificate and if I could find that and take my wife and, you know, six witnesses and a notary and I could get my license. And then once I get my license, I could, you know, work on recovering all my bank. I could, I could get by in life without my wallet, couldn't I? I don't need Jesus because I need my wallet. It's just a reminder that this is the kind of God that a big problem for me is a small one for Him when God answers prayer. But see, these individuals are all about finding their wallet. They're not about, wow, it's amazing I have a God that can make any situation not a big deal, not a big problem. And here they have the Son of God standing in front of them, and they're asking these disrespectful, dishonest questions. The questions aren't honest. You know, a lot of times people ask questions, and the questions just aren't, you know, you know it's, the question's false. Sometimes, the, sometimes the, the question is a true or false question, but the question itself is false. You know the classic one, right? Have you stopped beating your wife? You know, yes, I have stopped beating my wife. Well, it's an admission that you beat your wife. No, I haven't stopped my, beating my wife. It's an admission that I beat my wife. The premise is wrong. I've never beaten my wife, and so I've never stopped beating my wife. And people play these games with God all the time, too. And... 
they make the question about God not the real question. The real question about Jesus is have you believed in Him? Not is He God. Not can He do a miracle. That's settled. That's done. And so oftentimes when people ask God questions or people desire things of God, they're loaded questions. There isn't a right answer. It's interesting. Jesus never answers the question, when did you come here? He just exposed the attitude behind the question. Now, look down at verse 38. Uh, or verse, verse, I'm sorry, verse 36. I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Now, how clear is that? See, in verse 30, they said, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe? <clears throat> and then, Jesus said, You've seen signs and you don't believe. In other words, you're being dishonest. you already seen a sign. What did Jesus say later? He said, There's no, this, uh, An unfaithful generation seeketh the sign, there shall no sign be given it. It's not because Jesus hasn't done signs, it's because they don't believe the signs that He gave. Listen! The wise men came from the east because of the promise of their Messiah. Is that why the men came from Babylon when Jesus was born? Because of the promise of the Messiah? All right, they've got to bounce that basketball, don't they? Watch this. Get in here. Come on. Don't bounce the ball. We're in church right now. Good morning. Good morning. Have a seat. All right, I'll stop that. The reason people seek Jesus, or the reason they sought Jesus is because they want Him to perform for them. They want Him to do something for them. But Jesus said, you've already seen the things that I've done for you, and it has nothing to do with whether or not you believe. And the fact is, is that people who believe take the facts and receive them. And people who don't believe take the facts and reject them. Okay, so let's see this just a little bit further. In verse 41, now they're going to argue with Jesus. In verse, or Sorry, verse 39, This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which He hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again, at the last day. Jesus very, very plainly says, not only did He come to do the will of the Father, but in verse 39, He said that God wants me to not lose anything that He's given me, but raise it up again at the last day. What did was Jesus given? What did the Father give Jesus? What? You said it. Yes, I saw your mouth. Souls. Jesus gave, uh, Jesus was given souls. Let's go to uh, John chapter, chapter uh, 17 very quickly if you would. This is Jesus in His prayer to God uh, before, he goes to, before He goes to the cross. In verse 8 of John chapter 17, um, Jesus said, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. You see that word in John? Read John all the way through sometime and highlight or underline the word believe. Believeth or all the cognates of it. Verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the, for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And so I asked, and Renee answered, what has God given you? He's given, given souls. And uh, he goes on to, to pray for those that will believe as well. But go back to chapter 38. We'll read that verse again within its, within its uh, context. Verse 39, I meant to say. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which He hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. What did God want Jesus to accomplish when He came? Salvation. For whom? All the world. All that will believe. And Jesus, does, what was Jesus' goal as far as people goes? His goal is for everyone to believe, right? So here he is with a multitude of people who are mostly unbelievers. And he's telling them, 
If I could have the one thing, if I could accomplish the one thing that God wants me to accomplish, it would be that everyone believes. And here, friend, I want to remind us that believing is not up to God. Believing is up to us. There are individuals that, because of a false theological system, try to take passages right in the middle of this one. It's all about believing and making, making believe something that a person doesn't have a choice in. As though God made these individuals not able to receive the miracles that Jesus did. And friend, all I can say to you is that it is dishonest even, at the, even with the defining of the word believe. Belief is not something you do for me. Belief is something I do for myself. And belief is something I'm always responsible for. Many times individuals will fit it into a theological system that teaches that God chooses people before they're even born and gives them the ability or does not give them the ability to believe. And so God is responsible for their unbelief. But Jesus here is saying in this passage of Scripture, God wants everyone to believe. Do you see that? He wants, he wants me to keep every person or to save every person. How sufficient is is the work of the cross. How many people is the cross able to save? The whole world. It's sufficient for the whole world. And friend, this is so revealing because when someone tries to tell us the reason I didn't believe, we know that first of all, it's not God's fault. And secondly, it's not because you didn't have what you needed in order to believe. See, that's what they're saying. If, if the work that you want us to do is to believe, then you need to make it so that we can't not believe. Well, that's a double negative, isn't it? Uh, the, we need you to make it so it's impossible for us not to believe. Does God do that for anyone? I'm not sure. It's not because of the miracles Jesus did. Nobody's saying, I'm not sure if you really did that miracle. It's not the problem. So what they're saying is, I'm not overwhelmed by belief. Without making any choice of my will or my decision, I haven't just automatically believed, and so do something and make me believe. You can't do that for anyone. It can't be done for anyone. Because belief is a choice, the will. And what they're saying is, Jesus, go ahead and overwhelm our will, if you would. Jesus isn't going to do that. Verse 40, said, This is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. Notice that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him. Jesus doesn't say everyone that sees the Son has everlasting life, but it's everyone that sees the Son and believes on Him because that's the condition for eternal life. How can two individuals see God's creation and see something different? Does it ever blow your mind a little bit that... Brilliant minds, that is, people that God has made to be brilliant who have developed their minds and know incredible things can draw such ironic or ridiculous conclusions. A geological formation that's caused by the flood is self explanatory, isn't it? I mean, it just is. Grand Canyon. What's that? Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, the Grand Canyon. This be, for instance. I've been in Colorado and looked at, at shells seashells, you know, on the top of, you know, thousands of feet in the air. And, you know, in the air, not in the air, thousands of feet up on, on a mountain. And I've looked at them and said, man, that's incredible evidence of the flood. And yet, a person who has a higher intellect than I do, who has wasted more time getting educated than I have, will look at it and say, wow, you know, it's amazing how millions of years or billions of years this happened and the way they say it happened in billions of years is just ridiculous it, it defies the way a, a fossil is made and formed it just defies anything that's common sense or good logical reason and you have to ask the question why do two people look at the same thing and see something different you know you ever see the you know the psychologist's little pictures the ink blots what do you see I love making up things for that. <laughs> what do you see? The two people look at it, I see a butterfly. And then somebody else looks at it, I see a dragon. You know, two opposites. Two people can look at the same thing and see the opposite. How can a person look in, the, in a microscope at a leaf? How can you look at a microscope at an insect? 
and I see brilliant design. It's common sense, or it ought to be. How can you look at Jesus performing miracles and not see that He's God? It isn't the evidence, is it? It's the attitude. An attitude's everything. An attitude of belief or an attitude of unbelief, it's everything. It's everything. The same people have the same thing. All right, let's look at the conclusion of the disciples here. We could go on quite a bit. We will deal with the passage that you're hoping that I'll deal with about no man can come to me except the Father draw him and so forth. But go down to verse 66. Now, we won't deal with it today because of time. From that time, the Bible, or I'm sorry, verse 65, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Verse 66, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That doesn't say that they weren't saved, that they didn't believe in Him, but they went back and they didn't, they didn't follow Jesus anymore. They stopped following Him. Verse 67, Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that Thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of, Jesus, spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You see three illustrations or levels of belief here, don't you? Jesus had multitudes of disciples following him. A lot of times we think that it was Jesus and twelve. No, Jesus had a lot of followers, a lot of disciples. But... And when Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, sometimes we think, well, it's you know, the twelve apostles. No, it's the disciples. Remember the, what happened to the disciples of John the Baptist? They left John and followed Jesus. And remember the, when the Bible talks about many, many became disciples. So Jesus has all these disciples. And here He simply told them, the work that God wants you to do is to believe in Me. And a bunch of people said, huh. And they stopped following Him. Now, how difficult is belief? Once you've made the, the choice of belief, it's done, right? It's just a decision. It's incredible how belief can be agonizing. The choice, making the choice. But once you've made the choice, it's done. It's the easiest thing in the world to believe in Jesus, isn't it? Jesus did all the work. We think, oh, it's such labor intensive to believe. No, it's not. It's a choice. Yes or no? And it's done, to, the illustration in, to Nicodemus is it's done by looking to the cross. This reality. The reality of it, friend, if you think of it, is that we're lost and dead in our trespasses and sins. We're without hope. We don't have an alternative to Jesus. Well, if I don't believe in Jesus, then this is the method that I'm going to take, and I've got to decide which is better. There's no other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's not a choice of methods. It's just a choice of yes or no. It's a choice of looking to the cross. Friend, looking to the cross is the simplest thing ever once you've made the hard decision. And here the Bible, though, says that after Jesus had explained all these things, many of His disciples stopped following Him. They went back. <clears throat> what do you think they thought would be required? What do, they think, what do you think that they thought Jesus was going to ask them to do? I need you to leave all and do very difficult things. No, Jesus said, I need you to believe in me. And he said, that's too much. It's too much. That seems incredible to a believer, doesn't it? Does that not seem like a ridiculous problem that people... You ever see somebody just like, your problem's not a problem. I don't even know what your problem is. It just just do what you need to do. Just believe in Jesus. And I, I just I don't know if I can. I just can't. And then Jesus asked this question to the twelve, second group. Are you going to stop following me? And their answer was, for what? You you have the words of eternal life. You're the truth. If I don't follow you, who will I follow? If if not you, then who? I don't have an, I don't have an alternative. You know, that's a pretty good answer, isn't it? 
You going to follow Jesus? Well, what else would I do? What else would I do? Now you say, well, Pastor, you know, remember what happened at the cross? Yes, I do. And I remember what happened after the resurrection, too. No, that's the words of eternal life, is what they told Jesus. Now there was one guy that was, that was fake. Judas Iscariot. Jesus knew it and God knew it. Son of Simon. But Jesus is the real thing. And the hang-up with Jesus is believing. It just seems incredible, doesn't it? Fred, do you know to join a Jewish synagogue the average membership fee is $5,000? Did you know that? That blows my mind. I have a Jewish friend who's telling me what he paid to join his synagogue. He paid like $5,000 to join the synagogue. And he was grumbling about it a little bit, but it actually didn't bother him a bit. He'd a lot rather pay $5,000 than have to believe in Jesus. I was reading the other day uh, when I was in a, in a health facility, I was reading a Catholic magazine. And it was talking about reasons to join the church, but one of the major reasons to join the church was so that basically you could get on record for giving. So you'd have a local church to give to. Give to. There are a lot of people that would rather join a church and tithe than believe in Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it's just a fact. It's just true. That's, those are the hard, cold facts of life. There are people who have to sacrifice a great deal in order to go their route of not receiving Christ for free. You don't join the Baptist church so you can tithe here. Huh? You don't become a believer in Jesus so that you can build the organization. You receive Jesus so God can give you eternal life and it's free. You've never done anything for Jesus that God needed from you. God doesn't need anything from you. You can tell me today, Pastor, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give anymore. I'm not going to tithe. I couldn't care less, to be quite honest with you. And you know, I, if you think that God's going to save you because you tithe, you don't understand what giving is. I mean, it's just, it just isn't about that, is it? If you think it is, you've got a misconception about it, isn't it? You don't have anything that God hasn't given you. And everything that you have comes from God. And everything you need, Jesus has. And Jesus is. And you just come to Him, not because you want the kind of bread that perishes, but you come to Him because He is the bread of life. And that bread never perishes. If we were to read the whole passage, we'd read the illustration of Moses and the bread that they gave in the wilderness. They said, oh, our fathers had bread from Moses. Remember what they said about that bread. Remember when we read about what they said about the bread? <laughs> There's no bread, and our soul loathed this light bread. They, hate, they complained about the bread. Mm -hmm. But their grandchildren acted like it was the most wonderful thing in the world, that they had physical bread. That spoiled if you tried to save too much. And here is Jesus, God's Son, eternal bread. They'll feed you in a way that you'll never be hungry. What's the hunger that we all have? Well, the hunger is eternal life. That, that manifests itself all different ways. There are health stores that line the streets. There are religions that represent people trying to satisfy that eternal need for bread. And my friend, Jesus is the living bread. And he said, you know the work God wants you to do? Believe in me. Believe in me. How hard is that? You know, it's so easy. Sometimes we can't even, we can't even comprehend it. It's like, well, it's got to be harder, more difficult than that. It can't be that simple. Yes, it is, my friend. It's that simple. Believe in Jesus. So what's the difference between someone who believes and someone who doesn't? a choice. It's a choice of the will. These individuals saw miracles and they said, well, show us a miracle so we can believe. <laughs> Was that an honest statement? No, Jesus said, you saw the miracles. Believing is a choice. And you've seen it, haven't you? Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart and saying, this is so. The Word of God is a miracle, my friend. Holding a book that can speak to you the words of eternal life is a miracle. You've seen enough to believe but have you believed? Father, I just pray that you would help us to see this simple truth, to absorb and retain it, 
we just thank you so much. Thank you so much for loving us and caring about us. And God, thank you for making the gospel not something we do. Lord, we're so prideful that we would think that if we were required to do something to have eternal life, that we could do it. But we couldn't. And so Jesus did everything for us and made it so that we have to believe, and that's the only thing we can do. And I pray that you would help us to realize that and believe that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your attention this morning. You're dismissed. Durrell! <coughs> <coughs> I set my alarm, so I'll remember to bring that tonight.